All right, everyone, we're ready to get started here. And I know what you're thinking. I know you're thinking, how am I going to sing on a full stomach? So the answer is we're going to try our best, right? We're going to all try. And if we all sing together, no one will even notice, right? We'll all do it together, and we'll either, we'll either uh, pass or fail together. But the most important thing is we're doing it as unto the Lord, right? So we're going to, uh, we're going to start again in our medley of classic uh, hymns that we all know and love. The first one is at Calvary. And let's see how we make out. All right? We're ready. Wonderful. Well, we got about 20% of folks in, so that was good. Let's see if we can bring another 20% in. We're going to sing a, a, a song that, again, is, speaks. It's such a, a beautiful song. It talks about how our hope is in Christ alone. And I'm sure you all love this song, In Christ Alone. Let's sing it reverently together.
that note, if we can all stand together for our final song before we ask our speakers to come back and speak with us. Steve and Marley and Ted for the congregational singing. It sounds great up here. You did a wonderful, wonderful job at singing. At this time, we'd like to open up our evening session, calling upon Brother Noble George of the West Fifth Assembly to open our second session in prayer. Brother Noble. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this time. You allowed us to come together, and we heard amazing messages from your servants. Thank you for the time of fellowship. Thank you for the food that was served, and uh, we are nourished in our body. Now we again come together, bow before you to seek your face. We pray that you will bless us with your word again through your servant, Brother Gary. Thank you, Lord, for the many years of his service and many years of uh, preaching. He has done it so many times, yet today we pray you might fill him again with your spirit. Give him a fresh anointing so that he can speak to us with authority and power. And as we hear these challenging messages, Father, we have a responsibility. As we were reminded this uh, afternoon multiple times, this world is not our home. Yet, Father, you have placed us here. We are your ambassadors. And we see a broken world around us. Many of our homes have 
struggles and trials beyond uh, words can explain. And we pray that we will see that brokenness and uh, see our role in mending them. Father, help us to be the bearers of good news to those who are broken, that they will come to know the Savior. Father, this, uh, this time, the season, the season of uh, Easter, today is uh, Friday, and we know that what happened on that day 2,000 years ago. As we remember these things and uh, we understand it was for our sins that you died on the cross of Calvary, we were reminded you loved us so much that you gave yourself up on the cross of Calvary. You took our sins. You died for our sins and you rose again on the third day, victorious. And we have come to remember and give you glory again that. Father, we thank you. Remind us again of that love so that we can carry it into this world. Bless your servant. Bless your children. And we pray for blessing upon the session as we open your word. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. At this time, then, we'll call upon our brother Gary McBride to the platform. Brother. Thank you again, George. Now, you'll notice... Uh, the conveners wanted to have a little bit of variety between the two speakers. Uh, so there's a height difference, a nationality difference, a little bit of vibrancy difference, just a bit. Uh, when you look at the top of our heads, a uh, little bit of difference. Uh, they've been said that there's very few perfect heads, some are spoiled by hair, and uh, our brother qualifies there. Uh, actually, he's got what you'd call a heavenly pate because there's no parting there. <laughs> but uh, it's wonderful to share this uh, with Chris. I don't have Brian Gunning to pick on, so I had to pick on somebody. Uh, so uh, Chris will do. But it's uh, great to be here. I mean, after all these years of not being together, it is certainly a, a thrill to spend time in fellowship, uh, it was a great meal. Uh, just to have time together is just a wonderful, wonderful thing. We're going to look at some verses in Luke chapter 23. We looked at three reasons for the cross this morning. And this afternoon, we're going to look at three realities to do with the cross uh, this evening. <clears throat> Appreciate the fact that Shatford sang that song. It's about the cross, and it certainly is. You know, we, we live by faith and not by sight. And so our faith is based on the Word of God, not on what we see and hear and feel. But uh, in, in Israel, there are some things that certainly stimulate uh, thought and emotion. Certain places where certain things happened, and as you stand there, you just, you know, appreciate uh, not the reality because you have that in the Word of God, but you appreciate the, the scenery, the, the sense of being in that Place. And one of the places, of course, is the garden tomb. Uh, evangelicals control uh, that area, what we call the garden tomb, as opposed to the Church of the Sepulcher, which is in the city. Uh, the garden tomb has been excavated to a 2,000-year-old level, and it's uh, close to Golgotha. So it quite possibly uh, could be the place where the Lord Jesus uh, was laid. And, uh, of course, it's a you know, emotional scene to be there to see the sign that they have on the door. He is not here. Uh, he is risen. And when you go to the uh, far side uh, of that garden tomb, they have a bit of a platform, and you can go up there and look down at what we would refer to as Gordon's Calvary, uh, the place of a skull. Now, again, the uh, Orthodox churches have a place within the city that they would say where Christ was crucified, but very obvious that the Gordon's Calvary uh, looked like a skull. If you see pictures from the 1800s, uh, you can see the indentations where the eyes would be, uh, what was the nose is eroded off, it's not visible today, and there was another uh, you know, indentation at the bottom that would be uh, like a mouth. And so if you Google it and look back at the uh, early pictures of, of Gordon's Calvary, uh, you would see that, Golgotha. Uh, and so it's it's somewhat emotional to stand there when you're standing there up the hill is what's called the American Colony where Horatio and Mary Spafford lived. Uh, it is well with my soul, the author of that. 
Uh, General Charles Gordon was their guest for a number of months, and hence the, uh, the name for Gordon's Calvary. But when you're standing there, of all the sort of symbolic or significant sites in Israel, that's one place that has no tourists attached to it. As close as you would get to look at it is from this platform overlooking uh, the place. The bus stop outside the Damascus Gate is there, and so there's lots of people uh, milling around and, and uh, nobody paying attention uh, to Gordon's Calvary, to Golgotha. And it, it just seems to me it's, it's, it's almost like a, you know, a metaphor for the world today. Nobody cares about what happened there. It's not significant to people in this world. I'm sure if you ask people what Easter or Good Friday is all about, the majority would not have a clue of what the significance is. Uh, it's either Easter bunnies or it's nothing. It's a day off work, but nothing to this world. And yet for us who know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, there's no such place that's so significant or precious. It is about the cross. And so I want to uh, think of the three crosses tonight as we look at these uh, verses uh, here in Luke 23. And I want to read from verse 32 all the way down to verse 47. Verse 32 to 47. <clears throat> there were also two other criminals led with them to be put to death. And when they'd come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him, the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots, and the people stood looking on. But even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription was also written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you're under the same condemnation, and we indeed justly? For we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing, and nothing wrong. And he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. What a wonderful scene. You know, heart-rending it is for us to read it and to think of the fact that he died for me. But I want to think of the three crosses and those that were on those three crosses and what they, they signify, the reality of the, of the crosses. On the first cross was a man who was getting what he deserved. We might say it was a matter of retribution. He was paying the penalty for the crimes that he had committed. It wasn't unjust, it would seem. He wasn't uh, denied a, a trial. He had been uh, tried and sentenced, condemned, and now he's there on the cross suffering the consequences of what he did. He was being rewarded, we might say, for his crimes. This is where it, where it headed. And so we understand that in that day, capital punishment was the, you know, the, the result of certain rebellions, of certain activities, and this man was getting his due reward. And so on the cross, at first cross, this man, he's there blaspheming the Lord Jesus Christ, but he's getting what he deserves. But there is a sense, isn't there, when it should have been true of all of us. That was a cross that we deserved. As we talked this morning about what the law demanded and the fact that we're under the condemnation, the curse of the law, and it should have been us on that cross. I don't know if you ever think in those terms that there's somebody dying for their ungodly deeds, the words that they've spoken, the acts that they've done, but they're getting what they deserve. But for you and I who know Christ as our Savior, 
That cross isn't ours today, but for this man, it certainly was. Keep your finger there, but turn to Romans chapter 3. We'll see that what happened to that man should have happened to all of us. Romans chapter 3 is a list, the condemnation of humanity uh, here in this, this list. And so if we read from verse 10, Romans 3 verse 10, as it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none who understands. There's none who seeks after God. They've all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. Not, there's none that does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. Their tongues, with their tongues, they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. And so there we are, condemned, guilty in the sight of God. Our just deserts would be to be on the cross where this man was. When we get to Romans chapter 6, the wages of sin is death. That's what we, what we would de, uh, deserve. Uh, when you look over at Romans chapter 5, since we're uh, in Romans, just look across the page at uh, chapter 5 and verse 6. For when we are still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly, and so on. Talks about us being enemies being sinners. And so there we were, and that's what we deserve. So on that first cross, uh, justice was being served. The man was getting what he deserved. Uh, there was no appeal, there was no sense in which he could go to the president or a Supreme Court or somebody else. He was guilty, and he was suffering and getting what he uh, deserved. And so as we express, that's true for all of us. That debt Colossians 2, that was against us, was nailed uh, to his cross. In Ephesians 5, we were children of wrath, even as others. And so, that's the first cross. Justice is, is served. But on the second cross, a very different story, isn't there? It's interesting, isn't it? Uh, why would it be that the Lord Jesus would be on the middle cross? Three crosses to choose from. Why did he end up on the the middle cross, the one in the midst. Well, only within the providential plan and purposes of God, I'm sure, it might have been the cross for Barabbas, but there's the Lord Jesus on the middle cross. But what a difference with this cross. What a, a distinction between the man on this cross and the man on the other cross beside him. That man was guilty, deserving of his punishment. This man, of course, was, was innocent in every way. Pilate three times had declared, I find no fault in this man. Uh, I've interrogated him, I've looked at him, no fault in him. It's interesting, isn't it? Those that were intimate with him, closest to him, spoke of his purity. Uh, Peter, obviously a man of action, could say of him, he did no sin. John, who was intimate with him, leaned on his breast, could say, in him was no sin. Uh, Paul, who was the intellect, could say he knew no sin. And the Holy Spirit, obviously, in the book of Hebrews, gives us these words that he was without sin, sin apart, not part of his makeup at all, sinless, spotless, undefiled, the precious Lamb of God. And yet here he is hanging on a cross, a sinless, spotless victim uh, of that day. And so the necessity was that somebody had to die for us. If justice was served on that first cross, on this second cross, justice was satisfied in that the Lord Jesus Christ paid the price for our sin. He took our place, our sins laid upon him. And so we know that the soul that sins, it shall die. And yet here we are, and if we know the Lord Jesus, our Savior, we have eternal life. Why? Because he took our place uh, for us. He became that curse as we uh, talked about. 
But we also know that without the shedding of blood, there could be no forgiveness of sin. And so here's the Lord Jesus Christ uh, satisfying the justice of God. So here on the cross, his death was substitutionary in that he took our place. The pictures in the Old Testament of a lamb being brought, a sin offering or a trespass offering. And the offerer had to put their hand on the head of that lamb and actually identify with that lamb. The Day of uh, Atonement, there had to be a confession where sin was visibly and typically transferred from the individual or from the nation to that, that lamb. There was, there was personal identification. And so that lamb then became the substitute. And you think of Isaac in Genesis chapter 22. He's on the Mount of uh, Sacrifice, tied to an altar, the knife upraised, but there's a ram. It becomes a substitute for him, takes his place. Well, that's true for you and I. We deserve to be on that first cross, but somebody on the second cross took your place, took my place as a substitute for you and for me. And so that's a wonderful thing. We talked a bit this morning about the denial of the substitutionary atonement of Christ. And as I said, some of you may have, have heard of of this. Uh, interestingly enough, people who have been associated in assemblies like ours, some have espoused this, some have uh, adopted uh, this, the idea that uh, Christ was not punished for our sins, was not our substitute, but was merely an example uh, for us. Uh, there's a preacher in Ontario not associated with the, the assemblies, uh, recently caught doing other things who would uh, espouse or hold to that, to that doctrine. And so, uh, here is Christ on the cross, a substitute for you and for me, that lamb uh, that, took, that took our place. But the Bible says he is also propitiation for us. Now, I don't know the last time anybody used the word propitiation in the English language. Uh, it's just not everyday uh, conversation. Uh, but it has the idea of uh, to satisfy, the uh, sacrifice of satisfaction, that which meets the demands of the law. In the Old uh, Testament, in the Ark of the Covenant, the covering of it was referred to as the mercy seat, a place where justice was satisfied. So within the Ark of the Covenant was a law that was broken, not literally as, Mo as Moses once broke the tablets, but broken by the people of Israel. God looked down, saw a broken law, and needed to execute judgment. But of course, the blood was shed and applied to that mercy seat. And God looked down, as it were, and instead of viewing the broken law, he saw the shed blood. And on the basis of that shed blood, was able to pass over the sins of the people of Israel, anticipating the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, the coming of Christ, and the work of Christ on the cross. And so in Romans, and again in John, he's presented as a propitiation. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, he has the propitiation not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. Let me just stress that. The Lord Jesus Christ died for everyone. That's clear in Scripture, that he died for all. There are some who teach he only died for a certain group, for an elect group. But Scripture is very clear that the Lord Jesus Christ died for all. Chris was talking about compassion and sharing the gospel. We can, with assurance, sh share the gospel believing that God does not want any to perish. He calls all to repentance. He wants all to be saved. No pleasure in the death of the wicked. And so the offer of salvation is to one and all because Christ died for all. Why do we need propitiation in, in our Christian life? Uh, it talks about the fact if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who is the propitiation for our sins. So on the basis of his shed blood, we have continued access and ongoing forgiveness before the Father because of what he did on the cross. And so our sins are not only paid for uh, in the past, but our sins along the way are covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he was the atoning sacrifice or the sacrifice that gave satisfaction. God in his righteousness could not pass over sin. He couldn't say, well, you know, this person didn't know enough. This person wasn't good enough, but I'll let them in. God in his absolute holiness would hold to 
his integrity, we might say, hold to his holiness, hold to his standard. And all humanity has fallen short of that standard. And so somebody had to satisfy the demands of the law. And that's what propitiation is. The Lord Jesus Christ is our mercy seat. Uh, it's interesting, the publican and the, uh, the Pharisee in the temple, when the publican prayed, when he said, God be merciful to me, a sinner, in essence, he was saying, Lord or God, look at me as you look at the bloodstained mercy seat. I recognize, in other words, I'm under your just judgment, but look at me as under the blood. And so there on that cross, the Lord Jesus Christ was the propitiation for us. But he also, you know, in, in a way that we probably can't fully explain or appreciate, he paid a price we refer to as redemption or a ransom price. Now, usually, you know, if, uh, if somebody was kidnapped and, and uh, the kidnapper asked for a ransom, usually you pay to them. Now, of course, if your teenage son is ransomed, it may be cheaper to let the person keep them and feed them <laughs> than it is to ransom them back. But, sorry, the Shatfords are looking across. <laughs> but, uh, Usually a, a price is paid to somebody. What's not clear, of course, in this transaction where the price was paid, but a ransom was demanded. And so the Lord Jesus Christ paid that, that price, that ransom price. There are perhaps five different words in the New Testament, Greek words, for the word ransom. And the word that uh, is applied uh, here, or, or applied in, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, where Christ is set forth as a ransom for many, uh, has the idea of he went into the marketplace and paid the price and brought us out of the marketplace. A good illustration, and just for a devotional thought, if you look at the first three chapters of Hosea, uh, you see that. Hosea's wife proved to be unfaithful. Uh, she ended up in, in unsustainable debt and had to sell herself into the slave market. And God says to Hosea in Hosea chapter 3, Go and your, love your wife according to the love of the Lord for Israel. In other words, not the love you have, but the love I have. Go love her. And he went to the marketplace and he redeemed her. Fifteen shekels of silver and uh, one and a half bushels of, of uh, barley. And he redeemed her out of the marketplace and brought her home and said, Now you're my wife. Well, that's what the Lord did for us. He paid that price. He came to the marketplace of sin. You can imagine Hosea, the, the humiliation. Everybody in the community would know what had happened. And here's Hosea going and bargaining. Auction, she's on the auction block and he's, the price keeps rising and he pays the price to bring this unfaithful wife back according to the love of the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ did that for you and me. He paid that, that price on the cross. Not only uh, that, but when we think of him taking the place, I just want to present a little picture of one person that he really uh, substituted for and paid the price for, and that's uh, what he did for Barabbas. It's, it's amazing how this transpired. Obviously, the time of the year when the Lord Jesus died was very significant. It was time of Passover. His hour had not yet come, and yet this was the time. If you were to look at Daniel chapter 9, there's a calendar given in advance, and it's, it uh, gives us the approximate time of when the Lord's going to die, when he has to be on earth, and it had to be at the Passover time. So the body would not be left on the cross overnight, but also this transaction would take place. At Passover, they would release a criminal just uh, as a some sort of uh, thing for the, for the Jewish people. The Romans would release usually a, a notorious criminal. And so the choice is given uh, to the people in this occasion. Who do you want? Do you want Barabbas, who was a notorious criminal? Uh, Luke tells, tells us he was notorious. The other gospels tell us he was a murderer and led an insurrection. So he was rebellious and he committed murder. Whether he murdered an official or not, we don't know. But the choice was given them, who do you want to be released? Barabbas or Jesus who's called the Christ? That was the choice presented to them. Now what's remarkable too about this, this choice, uh, you, you might appreciate that 
the word, the prefix B-A-R in the New Testament means son. So Barnabas is the son of consolation. It wasn't Barnabas' name. It was a name attributed to him because of his character, because of what he did. So Barabbas is quite likely a name that's given to him. And so son of, well, somewhere in the New Testament, the rest of the name is mentioned, Abba, son of the father. How, how remarkable would that be, that one on the cross would be the son of the father, and this one would have that name as well, son of the father. Now, tradition says, and, and we don't know where these traditions come from, but tradition says that his first name was Jesus. That's what historical tradition says of, of Barabbas. And so that could be. But you think of this, that that's their choice. Who do you want, the son of the father or do you want the son of the father? Which one do you want? This man's notorious. But perhaps in Jewish eyes, he led a rebellion. He stormed the Senate, the Capitol buildings or whatever. And, uh, you know, well, he's a, he's a hero. He's a guy we, we admire and we don't want him to suffer as a result. But the chief priests and the scribes, the Pharisees, stirred up the crowd and said, let's call for Barabbas to be free. And what do we do with Christ? We'll crucify him. We don't want this man to reign over us. And so in a remarkable transaction, that middle cross might have been for Barabbas, and yet he wasn't there. I wonder what it was like that morning as the soldier walked down the hallway to the prison door and opened the door, and Barabbas would know that his end had come. And the guard says to him, you've been set free. Somebody else is dying in your room, in your place, in your stead. Somebody else is paying that price for you. What did Barabbas do? Would he have walked by that cross? Would he have sang, dying for me, yes, dying for me? There on the cross, he was dying for me. He could have. We don't know. There's no record, nothing to say what happened to Barabbas after that. But of all the people in the world, he had one who took his place. But it's true of every one of us. He took your place. He took my place. So the wonderful things that happened on that, that middle cross as God was satisfied and our salvation was wrought as a result of what the Lord Jesus Christ did on that, that cross. But what about the third cross? So much happened uh, in this scene that's remarkable as well. Now, another gospel tells us that in the first part of the morning, the Lord Jesus was on the cross from nine in the morning till three in the afternoon when he expired. We gave up the ghost, breathed his last. And the other gospels tell us at the in initial part of the day, both of these men hurled insults at the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, culturally very different than our setting. It was very common for crucifixions to be, as this one was, public. This was outside the Damascus Gate, whether it was the same gate or same place then. It was in a public place with a thoroughfare, with people walking by. And it would be quite common for, in most Roman settings, for somebody to take two, three days to expire on a cross and for have uh, interaction with the crowd. Often not good interaction, but the thief wasn't going anywhere and he could yell curses at people and people could revile him, depending of course on what he'd done and, and what they thought of him. And so it was not uncommon. The Jewish leaders were hurling insults at the Lord Jesus. They were saying, if you're the Christ, just as this man, save yourself, this man says, and us as well. But both of them were hurling uh, insults at the Lord Jesus Christ. But something happened in this man's heart and life that was transformative. Now, when you uh, think of, of what he saw, what did he see? He saw one hanging on a tree that had been battered and bruised and disfigured. In Isaiah 52, it says his countenance was so marred, he, in uh, paraphrase, he no longer looked human. He'd been spit upon, beard plucked from his face, slapped, crown of thorns on his head, uh, his back beaten. And so he was disfigured. He'd gone through all of, all of that. So this man's looking at this, the Lord Jesus on the cross, beaten, disfigured. It's interesting, just another devotional thought. In John 19, 5, that's how the Lord Jesus is presented to the crowd. Behold the man 
And Pilate presents him in that state, purple robe, crown of thorns, disfigured. Look at him. What do you want us to do with him? Crucify him. Same words are used in Zechariah chapter 6, but God the Father says, Behold the man whose name is the branch. And there it says he will be clothed in majesty. So last time he was introduced to the world, a man of sorrows. The next time he's introduced, the Lord of glory. Look, you saints, the sight is glorious. See the man of sorrows now? From the fight returned victorious, every knee to him will bow. And so that's what this man saw. He saw a man, a man disfigured, a man suffering, and yet not complaining about what was going on. But this man heard some things as well. He heard words of love. He heard the Lord Jesus in his agony on the cross, heard him made reference to his mother and commit her to John's care. Words of love. Here he is dying, but he's concerned about her. But more than that, he heard words of mercy. We heard them in song today. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. How could you be beside that and not be moved by it? The language in the Greek suggests it's, it was repetitive. It wasn't just said once. It was said several times. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. How could somebody do that in that situation? Well, Stephen in Acts chapter 7 says similar words. But here's the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, words of mercy. So this man hanging there beside him has, has heard these words of love and these words of, of mercy. And so now his heart is stirred and a change uh, starts to take place. Now, when you think of his condition, he really does illustrate the inability of humanity to change their, their way or their state on their own. This man had nothing to offer. He couldn't make any promises. He couldn't change his lifestyle. He couldn't say, I'll give, I'll, I'll attend church, I'll get baptized, I'll do... He couldn't do anything. He had nothing whatsoever to offer. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. That's all he could possibly, possibly do. A wonderful illustration of what it takes to come to the Lord. It's not what you have to give to him. It's by faith you receive. Now, it's interesting, it's been said, and this is by the way, that here is a, a deathbed confession. And you know, there's only one such deathbed confession in Scripture. And somebody said, there's only one, so none, or there is one, so none should ever despair. While there's breath, there's hope. But there's only one, so none should ever presume that they're going to have the opportunity that this man, this man had. But as he sees these things and as he hears these things, he recognized and said some amazing uh, things. He, he recognized his sinfulness. And so we read these, these words, for instance, in verse uh, 41, we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, he, he recognized we are sinful and we're getting what we deserve. That has to happen, doesn't it? Nobody would ever get saved without that recognition, without the understanding that we're sinful and what we deserve is a lost eternity. What Chris expressed this morning about where the sinner is headed that's what we deserve. But until you get to that place, it's interesting, uh, a number of us are involved in prison ministry, and some of the people that get saved uh, doing correspondence courses in prison ministry are terrible people, but they've come to an end of themselves. In the years that I have preached in prison and asked the question, is maybe in different ways, but it, has anybody here had never sinned? Nobody even flippantly has put up their hand. Everybody acknowledges that they are sinners. They know they're sinners. But it's when you come to an end of yourself and you realize you're a guilty sinner. And if there's anybody here today who has never accepted Christ as Savior, you will never get to heaven until you come to this point where you realize you're a sinner condemned under the judgment and justice of God and headed for a lost eternity. That's where this man came to. We're getting what we deserve. We're getting it justly. Justice is being poured out uh, on us. But so he recognized his guilt, but he recognized something about the Lord Jesus Christ at the end of verse 41. He said, this man has done nothing wrong. He recognized that here's a spotless, 
lamb. This man's done nothing wrong. No, he, he maybe didn't know much about the life of Christ, but as he watched him, and perhaps what he'd heard uh, in the last few weeks of, uh, before this, he knew that there was something unique about this man. And he could say, this man has done nothing wrong. In comparison to me, and what I'm done, and what I'm getting, what's just, and what I'm due, this man has done nothing wrong. This guy would do well preaching in New York City. He recognized what everybody needs to recognize, his sinfulness and a spotless, a spotless uh, Savior. He recognized, too, didn't he, the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says in verse 42, Lord, Lord. You can't be saved without knowing that the Lord Jesus Christ is God. Was God manifest in the flesh? Is God incarnate? Was God incarnate? Is God now in heaven? Without acknowledging the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, we accept him as Lord and Savior. You get saved, you may not understand the full implications of accepting him as Lord, but that's who he is. And so just as we have to recognize who we are, we have to recognize who he is, that he alone can, can save us uh, from our sin. And then there's a call for mercy. This man recognizes, he says, we're getting our due reward. We're getting what is coming to us, what we deserve to have. But he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's remarkable, isn't it? How did this man come to recognize that the Lord Jesus Christ was going to, that this wasn't the end for him, that there was something beyond this, that there was going to be a kingdom to come, and this was a king that was going to rule and reign, and that there was a position in his kingdom. I don't know if you ever sort of meditated on those thoughts and wondered, well, how did he ever come to that, that realization? He saw over the head of the Lord Jesus, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, but somehow, by the Spirit, by his recognition, he came to that realization that there's something more than this. This isn't the end. There's something more uh, to come. And so he spoke of or he, an appeal uh, for mercy uh, there in that, by calling him Lord and saying, remember me when you come into your, your kingdom. And so what a wonderful thing happened. And he received that assurance from the Lord. Today I say to you, you'll be with me in paradise. Now, I don't know if you've ever uh, talked to Jehovah Witnesses about this phrase. They will put a punctuation there. They will say, today, as in now, I'm saying this to you, you will be with me in paradise. They won't see it as one full uh, sentence. But it's true. He said, today, you will be with me in paradise. And so the Lord Jesus Christ took this man to paradise that afternoon. What, a, what a, an amazing the transformation uh, took place. And so this man was, was reconciled to God. What took place on that middle cross was applied to him. And so he went from being a stranger to being reconciled to God. Going back to what we were seeing in Romans chapter 5, Christ died for him. God commended his love toward us while we're still sinners. Christ died for us. And we, he goes on to talk about that. We've been reconciled to God. That's what happened to this man. Reconciliation means to bring two uh, opposing or warring parties together. Sometimes it happens in a marriage. Conflict comes and you ask somebody to come and intercede and hoping for reconciliation. So that happens in families, sometimes in assembly life. Uh, we understand that. Uh, in the Bible, God is never ever said to be reconciled. He never needed to be reconciled because he never moved. We as humanity have moved from God. So reconciliation is always applied to us. We need to come back into a right relationship. We need to be reconciled. God never moved. So he doesn't need the reconciliation. The work of reconciliation was done so that we could come back into a relationship with God. So God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. He is our reconciliation. He has reconciled us to God, brought us back into a proper relationship with God. So God never moved. Sometimes, uh, perhaps, uh, maybe even hymnology, it might refer to God being reconciled, but that's never true. We needed the reconciliation. That's what happened on this third cross. 
this man was reconciled to God because of what happened on the middle cross, because of what took place on that middle cross. So what was true of him that day? You know, some remarkable things happened to this, this man on that day. He went from being an alien, a stranger, as we read this afternoon in Ephesians uh, chapter 2, he uh, went from being afar off to being brought near, reconciled to God. He went from being a criminal to having a citizenship in heaven. He went from being an enemy of the state to being a friend of God, all in a moment of time. And those are things that certainly can apply to every, each and every one of us. When we accept Christ as our Savior, those things were true. From darkness to light, from a kingdom of darkness, kingdom of light, from uh, children of wrath to children of God. Uh, it's interesting that uh, Lewis Berry Schaefer in his systematic theology lists 33 things that happen to us the moment we accept Christ as Savior. I'm not sure if we threw it open, we might come up with 25 or so, but uh, it's interesting to read the 33 things that he lists that happened to us the moment we were saved. And that was true for this man, a man who could offer nothing, yet all those things were, were true for him other than perhaps the work of the Holy Spirit because the Spirit had not been given. But so many other things. And so this man was with Christ that afternoon. What a, what a transaction, what a transformation. So three crosses. The first cross, justice was served. The second cross, justice was satisfied. But also on the third cross, justice was satisfied, wasn't it? Because that man claimed the work of Christ. And so justice was satisfied. And so when we think of the results, that's the reality of what happened on the, the three crosses. There's some results from this. The thief on the one side, you know, he died only once that day, right? And now he is, according to Luke chapter 16, when we see that picture that the Lord painted, he's in a place of torment. Uh, we sometimes use the phrase lake of fire, but that's still to come. But the rich man was in a place of torment. Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom. And so this man died once, but he awaits a day of judgment, the great white throne judgment. And there, because his name will not be written in the Lamb's book of life, he'll be cast into eternal darkness, the lake of fire forever. The Bible calls that the second death. And so he only died once. It's appointed unto man once to die, after that the judgment. And so he died that day, but he faces eternal death. But what about the man on the second cross? He died that day as well. But he ever lives, doesn't he? He died once for sin, but he ever lives to make intercession for us. And so what a difference. He's, unlike that first man who's facing the second death, this man lives eternally. What about the third man? Strangely enough, he died twice in one day, didn't he? Before he died physically, he died spiritually. He died to self. He died to sin. He accepted Christ as his savior. The Bible presents that as the issue of salvation, where a death takes place. We're crucified with Christ. The world is crucified to us. I am crucified with Christ. That's a, a death. But this man died physically as well. But he doesn't face the second death. He faces an eternity in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a wonderful ending to the story. And so for you and I who have accepted Christ as our personal savior, we can look at these crosses and be so thankful we're not on that first cross getting our due reward. We can be thankful for that man on the second cross, the middle cross who took our place. And be thankful then if we're like the man on the other cross we have the forgiveness of our sins, eternal life, a home in heaven, a future that's secure, all because of what the Lord Jesus Christ did on the cross. We sang, or Shatford sang for us, hallelujah, what a savior. Can we say amen? For sure, what a savior we have. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the scene of these crosses, the scene the world uh, knows nothing about and doesn't appreciate 
but a scene that uh, we can revel in and uh, recognize that, uh, but for the grace of God, we would be on that first cross. We we're so thankful that in your grace and love and mercy, one took our place on that middle cross, and he paid the price for our sins. He became the propitiation, the substitution, uh, paid the ransom, supplied redemption so that we could be made right with God. And we thank you for this wonderful picture that's painted by this man being on this other cross, uh, recognizing who he was and what he deserved, recognizing who the Lord Jesus Christ was and what he had to offer, and then accepting that and asking for mercy and receiving eternal life. And so, Father, we thank you uh, for your mercy and grace. And we pray that each one here this afternoon, this evening, can say that they are on the right side of that cross, that they would be on the side of that thief who was forgiven, that their sins have been dealt with and that they ho have a home in heaven. If there's anyone who is still on the other side of the cross, still in their sin, unforgiven, not realizing the judgment that's ahead of them, not realizing what the Savior's done for them, we pray that you'd speak to their hearts and uh, by your spirit bring conviction of sin and bring them to the place where they would want to place their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, we thank you for the time today. We commit the next message and service to you. The young people, we thank you for so many that are here. We pray that you'd work in their hearts and lives, again, for your glory. We pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, this concludes session two of our Friday portion of the two-day conference. We'll take a break. And then the young people will be gathering here for the youth praise team and also for the ministry from our brother. Um, so uh, at this time then, we'll wish you adieu and we'll see you tomorrow, 1 p.m. The doors open and the conference starts at 1.45 p.m. Thank you for coming. I know that many of you came a great distance and that's very encouraging to us and to all those that are involved with the conference. So God bless and thank you again.